it's devoted to players. Uh, as we know, um, football wouldn't exist and women's football wouldn't exist without the, the women who play. And this uh, panel to me is, is very exciting, uh, a little bit diverse, but uh, super excited to have them here. So I'm gonna do a brief intro of each of the panelists and I'll, I'll start on the uh, far end and work my way back this way. Um, so Emma Starr uh, is a center midfielder for Eastern Suburbs Football Club in Brisbane. Part of that, she was with Shelburne FC in Ireland where she won the 2022 um, Women's National League Championship and the Irish Cup and also played in the Champions League. She's also played professionally in Ireland, for Galway United in Ireland, where she was player of the year. Also in Austria, Czech Republic, and Denmark, played soccer for George Mason University, where she was captain. Also, I used to, I used to teach there, but I didn't teach Emma. Um, she is passionate about the environment and is currently working with Gone West, an organization that plants trees to offset uh, carbon damage that traveling can produce. She's also, um, known for her blog on World Press, which is entitled She Shoots, She Scores, which is about her international experiences. So if you don't hear enough today, you can check the, the blog out. Then we have um, Rianne Reed, who is a defender on the Dominican Republic national football team and currently plays with South Melbourne Football Club. Part of that, she played at FC North Shilon in Denmark, while also working as the fan shop manager and character coach to the under 13, 14, and 16 girls' academy teams. She's played in Sweden for three clubs and in the USA for FC Kansas City, where she was a first round draft pick in 2016. She played uh, NCAA soccer at Rutgers University, where she was named first team all Big Ten conference player. She's also co founder of the Players Network, which is a community network platform that helps give players resources, tools, knowledge, connections, and confidence they need to make informed decisions as they pursue a career uh, abroad. Um, and perhaps uh, they can learn from your experience um, as well. Um, then uh, Sarah Carlick is a PhD student at Swinburne University and community project officer for Melbourne Victory Football Club. Her PhD investigates the lived experiences of migrant women football players. She's also a USSFC certified uh, with a significant experience coaching women's football at university and youth levels. As a coach and international women's football player, Sarah understands the lenses which sports are viewed and is motivated to ensure the next generation of women football players have the tools, resources, structures in place to succeed. Common theme, which is I love uh, the giving back and, and uh, supporting future generations. Then um, we have, whose uh, name is Jesse. Right. Jesse was on the panel this morning, uh, and you may have heard uh, she has just retired as captain uh, and central defender for FC North Zealand in the Danish Premier League, winning the Danish Cup in her final match as captain. Yay. And is now um, moving on to the other side of the, of the, the, the line and is the um, women's um, player director, sporting, guess, director. sporting director, women's sporting director, also uh, for FC New Zealand. She also led the team when they were the first European team to do preseason uh, training camp in Africa uh, when they went to Ghana. And if you if you don't know the FC New Zealand model, uh, it's owned by Right to Dream Foundation, uh, and they have academies in Ghana and Egypt and other places where we'll hear about that uh, tomorrow. And then uh, last but certainly not least, we have a real live Matilda with us. So uh, welcome, Elise Kellen Knight, Olympian and 2011 and 2015 FIFA Women's World Cup All-Star, plays for Melbourne Victory in the A-League Women, played with the Brisbane Roar, yes, Queensland, from 2008 to 2015, and then for several leading European clubs for, before playing for the OL Reign, in Seattle and the Washington Spirit in the NWSL in the US. She has 13 caps to the under 20 Matildas and wait for it, 113 caps for the Matildas since her debut in 2007. Elise was named to the all tournament teams for both the 2011 and 2015 World Cups for outstanding play. 
And I know a lot of people have been talking about scoring direct from corner kicks. Um, well, somebody did it in the 2019 World Cup, at least scored directly from a corner kick in the round of 16 match against Norway. She was the W League's Young Player of the Year in 2009, Football Federation of Australia, now Australian Football Female Footballer of the Year for 2011. Played a key role in securing two W League championships, one premiership with the Brisbane Roar, also won the Women's Asian Cup, the Tournament of Nations within the Tournament of Nations with the Matildas. She's on Football uh, Australia's Women's Football Council and is also an executive committee member at the Players Football Association and FIFA Pro Global Players Council. Plus, I also know, like Emma, that she has a strong interest in the environment and environmental work. So welcome everybody on the panel. And uh, this is this is super exciting for me. I don't even have a chair, but uh, I wanted to I wanted to start with um, just you know each of you has experience of playing in other countries, and so I wanted to get a just a a, a snapshot from your own uh, perspective as to you know what led you uh, to play in other countries and what what have you learned and what opportunities you know do you feel have been out there for you uh, as, as uh, players. Ray, you've got the microphone so you can start. Hello. Um, so I, like John mentioned, I was drafted to Kansas City um, in 2016. So I spent a year and a half there and it was a whirlwind. It was so much faster and stronger than I thought it was gonna be. So I spent those years learning and my second year came around and I asked the coach, I said, I want to play more. What do I need to do? And he said, you need more experience. And I said, how am I supposed to get the experience if you don't put me on the field? And he gave me advice as if I was his daughter, which I really appreciated. He's like, you should go abroad. You need to go get more experience out there. Um, I didn't want to go. I'm a very much a homebody, or I was, not anymore. <laughs> um, but I, I took that step of going to play abroad because I, I needed the experience. And at the moment, I wasn't good enough to play in the NWSL, and I knew I wanted to continue to play professionally. I didn't want that to be the end of my career. So I took the step to Sweden, um, played in the league there, and that kind of opened my eyes to the world of what it meant to play abroad. It was nothing I ever thought of uh, growing up that I would play soccer uh, across the world, but it's opened so many doors from there. I went to Denmark, now I'm here, um, and it's just been an incredible way to experience the world and learn different cultures of football in different places and meet a lot of different people as well. Sure, I can echo off of the, the different cultures. So I played in, Israel was the latest, played in Italy, um, been to Australia twice. So I'm currently living and playing in Melbourne. And for me, the cultural aspect was something that was really fascinating to me early on. So I tore my ACL in 2011, um, back when I was playing high school. And that's when I decided that I wanted to play professionally. I'm a small fullback, and so to be a small fullback trying to play in NWSL, that wasn't going to happen. So for me, I think early on, I knew that if I wanted to play professionally, it was going to be abroad. And so once I got my first opportunity in Italy, thereafter, it was just being, you know, bouncing around from club to club, country to country, and trying to soak up as much of the languages, as much of the um, meeting new people as I could. And it's just been a really incredible ride and journey along the way. Yeah. Um, I knew that I always wanted to play abroad. Um, I kind of want to use soccer as a tool to live in new places, meet new people, and like explore new cultures, just like they said. Um, so I kind of had no problem leaving America, to be honest. Uh, I kind of also knew it was extremely difficult to get drafted, especially if you probably don't really stand out a lot in your college career, and maybe your university isn't you know, one of the ones people frequently look at. So I was pretty realistic um, in the fact that I wanted to play abroad. Um, figuring it out was difficult without a lot of guidance from my college coach or figuring out how to work with agents. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, that's one thing I'd love to see change going forward is just more information available to college players and kind of like a example of a pathway um, to kind of just help us transition out of college and figure out, you know, where you can play, um, visas, et cetera. But yeah, so far it's been great. Um, I want to continue playing for at least a few more years till I'm Jesse's age probably. Um, and yeah. 
Can I ask you for a favor to tell us that Claude be grateful and I'll be really 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 interested? Um, I played for SC Kansas City in the U.S., um, Karn Sweden EK in Sweden, Eskilstuna United, um, and then most recently FC Norseland, and now I'm with South Melbourne. Um, I played for Villarup Skoglunde uh, in Denmark. I played for FK Dupa Praha in Czech Republic. I played for Galway United and Shelburne in Ireland, and then I played for, I'm actually blanking on FFC Borderland in Austria. <laughs> I was with Yusina in Italy, Emeka Fair in Israel, Morton Bay in Brisbane, and currently with Keeler Park in Melbourne. And um, I started a small club in Australia, which is Peninsula Power, and then I moved to Ikupsala in Sweden. Uh, I spent a season with Glenn Torren in Northern Ireland, and then I've been with FC Norseland in Denmark for the last three. Um, and do you want to do the clubs first? Or? Okay. Uh, so again, a, a heavy emphasis on Americans uh, here, and I'm another one of those pesky ones. Uh, and just to give you an idea of a country who has 330 million uh, people, and then the NWSL, it's, it's grown, but when I was kind of trying to get into it, it probably had about 250 players. And then if you think about players entering the NWSL at around 20 at the time, no 16 year olds then, uh, to maybe close to 36, 37, that's 16, 17 generations of players competing for 250 spots. So the reality is that um, if you aren't, you know, that top 1% or even less, then you do have to go abroad. Uh, so that's what most, most Americans end up doing, I would say, if they want to continue their playing career. I think I also wasn't necessarily interested in playing professionally when I started playing overseas. I just wanted to get out of the U.S. and do something a little bit different. And then I reminded myself that I'm highly competitive and that once I was playing at a semi-professional level again, it was time to kind of move up. Um, John, you asked about the differences in the cultures and in my experience, Scandinavia, without a doubt, is kind of the where I have experienced the most amount of development. So it's it's been really interesting to see different FAs at work and the different levels of professionalism between those countries. Um, and yeah, so throughout them, especially in Sweden and Denmark, I've, my eyes have sort of been opened up into how I think that other FAs can uh, structure things and how the developmental model can change so that one, there's more opportunities for each country, but then so that when players do take the opportunities, they're actually getting the most out of them. So, um, where to start? So, on the back of the 2011 World Cup, I got my first opportunity to head overseas. Uh, I got scouted by a Danish team for Tudor Yarin. Um, a lot of Aussies at that time got asked if they want to come over. What's so funny? You just don't we'd like, like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a rivalry up here. Um, I didn't stay long, so okay. maybe <laughs> three months I lasted. Um, I think about four or five of us actually headed over the same time, so that was a bit unusual. It was never a dream to play uh, overseas for a club. I always wanted to play at the top level, but ne not necessarily overseas because it just wasn't feasible. Um, I was studying, uh, becoming a pharmacist uh, well into my studies and just thought I was always going to have a dual career type thing and be able to manage both. And I was happy playing at my Brisbane club, Brisbane Raw, fellow Queensland. Um, so that was always a dream and had an unfortunate injury in my first club stint and I uh, just decided to come home. I wasn't going to go through a rehab process overseas. And that was the end of that rehab, got back to a, a good level and then got curious again and had an offer come in from Japan. Um, that one I just took up because I was curious. I like different cultures and, Thought it was a, a good opportunity, a short-term contract. Really enjoyed that. Um, came back to Australia. I started preparing for the 2015 World Cup. Um, always felt comfortable in my own country. We didn't have a full-time league, so you never got regular games, which was always an inhibitor. But um, I never looked past it because I was doing a million things off the field. So I was still enjoying it. And then 2015, um, things got really tough for us with the Matildas. We had massive time constraints. Uh, we were in camp for about four months continuous, so I could no longer work. We weren't paid enough. On the back of that, um, we went on a strike saying we can't really do this anymore. Like we, we need to be paid decently. Um, and then we did that. And at that same time, I got a good opportunity to go to Germany at Turbina uh, Potsdam. 
Um, and there I signed a three, two year deal and then extended to a three year. And that was probably something that I saw long term. Again, not a well paying contract, but just something where I could play, you know, 20, 25 games in a season um, and just have basically the environment to become a better player. I mean, I was 25 at the time. I needed to push myself a bit. Um, and then actually end up staying in Europe for about eight years. Um, I had a stint in America where, again, I got curious. Like a lot of us are over in America. I wonder what this league's like. Um, but didn't actually enjoy it so much. And I left there and jumped back to Europe. So I've travelled around a fair bit. Um, and I've landed back in Australia now at Melbourne Victory. Great. Now, that, that sort of raises a question that I've had and I've heard several people talk about in the lead up to the World Cup given that almost all the Matildas now play internationally. Um, so is, is, the, is that a good thing for the Matildas in Australian football, or is there something that uh, needs to happen potentially in the A-Leagues to uh, sort of elevate the level of competition? Or what, what kinds of things, um, um, what, are, what are the good things and the challenges, for example, uh, for someone like yourself? Yeah, the inhibitor has always been number of games. So if you're not playing a full season, 22 plus games, you're not getting enough football in a season. Um, but I think the A-League's now branched out to that. So we're going to have a full season. But I have to be honest, the quality is not there for a world stage. So we've got players in the Matildas at the moment um, that have come off the back of the A-League and they're doing really well. I 100% think it's possible. I think you can get to the level, but it's hard. It's really hard. The intensity the speed of the play, everything that you're exposed to in a training environment, it's just not quite there. Because if you jump over to Europe at a good club, don't get me wrong, there's some very average clubs in Europe. So if you get that balance wrong, um, but if you're in a good environment in Europe, you're going to be challenged a lot more. And I think this is why we're seeing such great performances from the Matildas, because we're suddenly at that level. I think having a minority of the team still playing in the A-League is fine. I think you can certainly do that. I mean, Courtney Vine's been... Um, exceptional. Maybe her World Cup performances haven't been at the level they have been in the last six months, but she's proven you can play in the A-League and still jump up to international level, but it is hard. And, uh, you know, you, you American players, we're talking about the limited number of places, and then you have international players come and take some of those places in the professional league. But um, you um, all came through the university system. And uh, I know Jesse and I were having a, just a side discussion the other day, and I'd, I'd love to hear some perspective on this as for the future development of uh, American players, uh, particularly as professional opportunities expand around the world. Uh, is that the best sort of approach for an, a young American player to take or an international player? A lot of international players come into the, to the college system in the US. Uh, is, is that the, the right way forward or is an academy structure um, more beneficial? I think it certainly depends on your goals. I think if you are a top, top player, then you're probably not going to want to go the American University route because the emphasis there is, yes, on your athletics, but it's also equally, allegedly, as important um, for your academics. That's The verdict is out on that. But um, But if you are a top player, that's not going to be in my opinion, the best choice right now because the season is completely condensed. So you mentioned, you know, 20, 22 games in a in a season over the course of the year. And it feels like in the NCAA, they do that in three months. So American uh, soccer players are playing two matches per week, maybe having one tactical session at most a week and the rest of the time you're recovering or um, the players who aren't getting as much time are getting pushed. So certainly from a developmental perspective, the NCAA isn't where you're going to want to spend four years of your life. Again, if you're a top player, if you're a player who's just wants to keep playing and doesn't have ambitions to play professionally, I think certainly the NCAA is a great route to go. Um, I think American players still believe that the NCAA is the best way to get into the NWSL. I'm not convinced that NWSL is the best league in the world. Certainly some of the finest athletes and a really fast competitive game, but not the most pure form of football and certainly not the players who've de dedicated um, certain amounts of time to like tactical, tactical and technical awareness. So even though it wasn't really an option uh, back when I was going into university, or at least it wasn't a popular option. If, if I were going to suggest something to a serious 17-year-old 
soccer player in the United States, um, I would say you should go to a developmental academy in Europe in particular. I wanted to raise, since you're getting the microphone, I wanted to kind of do a follow-up with you. We were, I read in the paper the other day where 18 of the Philippines players uh, are American citizens as well and grew up in the, in the U.S. You play for the Dominican Republic. So tell me a little bit about how that came about and what sort of um, challenges you see between uh, a national team like the Dominican Republic versus what, uh, for example, resources are there for the Matildas or for the, the U.S. national team? So um, I actually only got my first cap um, back in 2021. I am Dominican, my mother is Dominican born, but my name is Brianne Reed. So you don't notice the fact that I'm Dominican. My mom's name is Yolanda Mercedes Perez, which is much more Dominican. Um, so I actually had to write a letter to the Federation asking if I could play for them uh, because they didn't know that I existed essentially. Um, but similar to the Philippines, more than half of my team is American born. I wanna say maybe I can count on one hand the amount of Dominican born players that um, I play with. And it's encouraging but sad because I do see the talent that there is in the Dominican Republic, but because they don't have the same infrastructure leagues, clubs to play for, they don't get to the level that they can to be able to go to the national team. So we've had girls who've left and they'll go to school in the US and then they end up getting the call back into the national team because that's the group they need to get in, either, in order to improve to be able to play um, at the national team level, but in terms of our resources and and the experience that I've had, it's been it's been a shock um, because I grew up in the U.S. and I've followed the U.S. and their system and what it looks like to be on a national team is so far from what I've, what I've experienced. Um, luckily, my team is very resilient and we find the joy in a lot of the situations that aren't the best. Um, but I just think it's it's such a difficult fight, even just talking with our federations, the macho culture that is still in the Dominican Republic. You can barely get a conversation in with the president with him taking us seriously. And it gets to the point where you just like, you, you don't want to continue to be battered and pushed back. And you feel like your voice isn't heard and we're trying, we'll keep trying, but I, I, I know it's going to take years and years and generations after us for, for us to be able to compete. Um, on the stage, I can't remember, it might have been in the first panel, someone said that their federation wasn't entering them into com competitions. And my research prior to um, joining the national team, everything said, did not enter, did not enter, did not enter, did not compete. So I didn't even know if the national team was actually competing at the international level. Um, but we've gotten better with having more consistent camps. But after our World Cup qualifiers, we went a year without having anything because they fired our coach and we didn't have anything. And that was off the back of, um, we played Jamaica in our last World Cup qualifier game. We had to tie them or beat them in order to go through to the CONCACAF championships. And that was the best run the Dominican Republic has had. We lost 5-1, but we celebrated like we beat them. Um, but I remember the girls on Jamaica coming out to us uh, after the game, specifically Bunny, and we were all crying. And she was like, we were you guys. like." Just keep going, you'll get there. I know it takes time, but it was just so encouraging to hear other players who have been there, who've had the same fights and understand the, the complications that come with being a small resource federation. Um, it was really encouraging and seeing them now performing the way they do, I know it's inspiring um, all of my teammates as well. And uh, one, of the, one of the breakout teams, I know they didn't win any matches, but uh, I'm certainly a big fan of the Irish team, especially because they drew with Nigeria and uh, put, put Australia top of the group, which means I can see them at the Olympic Stadium uh, in Sydney and not have to travel. But uh, now, uh, so a couple of you have played in Ireland. And so that that team has come on uh, in recent times. So what's, uh, what's sort of the kind of secret sauce for a country that's coming up, uh, you know, I, I get in Bree's situation that it's it, it's going to take significant international resources as well as national resources. But Ireland is a developed country. They're ranked number one in the world in men's rugby. The rugby sevens women are, have qualified for uh, the Olympics. 
uh, football uh, itself is a big sport. So what what's kind of the uh, behind that um, uh, kind of emerging team? Well, it's, I guess, similar in a way to the Matildas, because when you look at their team, a lot of them don't play in Ireland. There's about, I think, two players currently on the squad that actually play in the WNL. Um, so that's kind of an issue. And then also right now in Ireland, a lot of their focus is on maybe like rugby and Gaelic. And you see even like top tier players in the WNL who are playing both sports, like semi-professionally, they'll come from their Gaelic match to play in the WNL. Um, so it would just be kind of shifting the focus and bringing more attention to soccer, I think, and also like visibility. It's getting better now because I've heard even just in recent days in the media, um, people coming out and saying that, you know, Katie McCabe is the best Irish footballer. And they're not saying like female Irish footballer, they're saying she's the best Irish footballer and this is why. And they're kind of showing her progression through her youth days and where she's at now. Um, and I think just kind of shifting like the language around that is like a big deal just for like a country like Ireland to be like, no, she's like an athlete and she's the face of Ireland. And it's not that she's the face of female sports. It's like, she's our athlete there. Katie Taylor is a boxer there who everybody knows. They say she's the best boxer. They're not saying she's the best female boxer. So I think that like for countries and federations just like focusing the whole like culture and media maybe around like giving more emphasis to women's sports and giving it more visibility like I think the world cup here they've sold more jerseys than the men's world cup did before during and after and that was before the first game even started and that was with limited visibility when you compare it to men's resources so you you see what like what can happen with women's sports when you give it just a little bit so imagine if you gave it even more Great, and I've got, I've got one more question and then uh, see if anybody from the floor would like to ask something as well. And Elisa um, mentioned this a little bit and Jesse, you did in an, an earlier session about um, sort of player power and fighting for equal pay or equal opportunity. Uh, what is the role of players in basically advocating for themselves and for uh, women's football and what is the responsibility uh, of the federations and the and the club uh, owners and directors uh, in response to that? Um, I can start with this and uh, my perspective has changed greatly in that six weeks ago I was on the player side advocating for the players and now I'm a director telling them no you can't have that uh, so it's, it's changed a little but um, to be honest with you and John I think you might have mentioned this is getting women who compete in football into the positions where they're making decisions because we have uh, and sorry Bree because you're not at Arsenal anymore but we just gave you know upcoming 17 year olds better contracts than I had my first three years at Northland as a captain and a starter playing almost every game. And then I, you know, we signed a 17 year old giving her, her more than I had last season because we've decided to make the investment. And I think that's a part of being in the room of the people making the decisions and then having a club that is, we're pushing to, uh, again, I've said this earlier, but put their money where their mouth is a club that preaches equality and equity and things like that. And then we say, okay, well, this is how. Um, so certainly it's on the, there is responsibility on the player and you have to ask because if you aren't asking for things, you're not going to get them. That's just the nature of any business and it's not different in sport. But on the other side of things, um, the organizations need to step up and be able to support women. And there's a lot of low hanging fruit in this industry. Uh, you don't have to, give us private jets and business class all the time, but there are some things that are really easy to provide meals within the organization or, you know, things like that, where it's just, it's just it seems like a simple ask, but we're often denied, or I'm sure all of us have been denied those things in the past. Um, so while I do believe that it's, it's a, a responsibility of the individual player, organizations as a whole need to start. Um, one thing I'd like to do in Danish women's football is to start a, uh, banding together with some of the other teams to raise the standard. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but we do have a unique opportunity in women's football. For example, I plan to have a meeting with the sporting director at Bayern Munich in a couple months. And I plan to also have one with the sporting director at Arsenal. And in the men's world, where would the Bayern Munich 
board director be willing to give you advice as a smaller organization trying to trying to take strides forward it's just unheard of so i think there is something different in the women's game where we have this opportunity to challenge the industry as a whole and take steps forward as a whole and then we can start to beat each other down like the men do but until we all get there it's it's kind of one uh one big not happy family but one big group of us that needs to kind of drive things forward yeah i think just to echo that collectivism is the key you see some of the teams at this current world cup are in a bit of a disaster zone. Um, Spanish are probably something that comes keep like a front of mind. Um, and they're just players putting their own necks on the line. I just, don't, I just don't know how I feel about that. I don't know if I agree with it. I don't think it's up to an individual to do it. You look at Hegerberg, who did it as well at Norway. And I just think like, it's your career. It's your playing career. Why do you need to put your neck on the line? I think that's unfair. I think when it's done as a collective, it's extremely powerful. And that's what we got right at the Matildas where it was a collective. It wasn't even just... 23 players it was actually beyond that it was the young Matildas we got on board it was it was every single female football that was potentially going to play for Australia where we were able to make that stance whereas when single players put their neck on the line I don't know it's a bit of a high risk and you're jeopardizing your own career I can just say a little a few things um I don't also steal Breeze Thunder for all the work that she's been doing with the players network but that does come to mind and the reason why I say that is I think transparency is something that's Real, really important. I've had a number of conversations over the years with young players who are getting, you know, ready to finish their senior year at university in the U.S. and they're looking to have sign their first contract and go abroad. And they don't know what to ask for. They don't know what a contract looks like. Um, they and so it takes it's taken me several years to be able to understand what those negotiations look like, what are things that are should be standard or that you think are standard um, to be able to, you know, talk about for your first contract or your second and so on. Um, but I think that transparency is something that's important. I wish that players, younger players, were talking a bit more about this with um, players who have, you know, a bit of uh, years of experience. And like I said, um, don't want to steal Breeze Thunder, but she can speak to, you know, all the work that she's doing with the Players Network, because I think that that's a great start just to be able to connect international players abroad and just be in a room to ask those questions, because I just don't think they're necessarily asking enough questions. Speaking of questions, we do have one in the audience. <laughs> Hi, I'm Katrina Wallstrom from the United States Sports Academy. So I just had a quick question. You know, a lot of change happens from the outside stakeholders, such as your fans, your spectators. What role would you like to see your spectators play in initiating change in uh, women's football? <laughs> I can start just by um, adding a caveat uh, is that you need spectators there first. Um, and, and I'll be completely honest, our women's team at Northland has a very, uh, very limited amount. Uh, yeah, a small but loyal fan group. Um, and we have a, a pretty loyal men's fan group. So that's the first step is, uh, is having spectators. And I know that's kind of basic, but then someone can add from <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. Turn up, turn up and be loud. Um, I think that's the only thing you can do as a fan. You need to make noise in whatever capacity that is. It's going to a game, but it's also everything around the game. So it's being able to create that following because at the end of the day, people look at the bottom line and oh, people don't turn up to the game. It's like, well, okay, <laughs> the product's there, so we need to support it. And I think um, it's probably the only thing the fans can really do. Yeah, like the Colombian spectators. That was my <laughs> they were incredible. Well, first of all, this panel is I just, I love it. The media might think fascinating. Uh, one, because of course it's not run by academics. So. <laughs> <laughs> I have of questions, but uh, let me just ask two. One is, can you speak to the fact about is how is it different being coached by a man as a woman versus a woman? Like the media, I'd like, I'd like to address that. And uh, following the, the, the very important point about spectators, uh, uh, to me, all of this is 
doesn't work without the consumer export. You guys are the producers. So the question is, how do you, what is the link? How do you are now applicable buyer? I mean, I studied buyer in some detail. Uh, even seven years ago, if you mentioned from Fusbad, you know, you were looked at askance. They were just, this was a joke. And now it's not. And in fact, I think the advantage of the European system, you addressed it a little bit and, and you know, in, in response about uh, which bar was the better one. And, you know, I, I wrote a book on, on this, and I actually agree with you that ultimately, I think the ultimately at the top level, the, the European club level is better. But uh, it's better because there's a linkage to France. And so what is so interesting is that in the last four, five, six years, these big clubs in Europe have really latched onto the women's game. And this means that there is a link to the France, still very tenuous. Clearly, you buy a part of a guy from, uh, from, from the Allianz Group, whatever, you will not show up to other buy and women's game. But it's now being taken seriously. So I think that on the fan level, there too, the, Europe has an advantage because in, in the United States, the clubs are not linked to other clubs. And I, in fact, I think the WNBA model is a good one. Because in fact, you know, the sparks are linked to the Lakers, et cetera, et cetera. There's some problems with it. But and on some level, if you want to tie the link to the fans, which is crucial, otherwise it's sort of basically a sport in a vacuum, which is fine for the purpose of it. The link to the fans is crucial. Okay. So those are the two right. So the, the first was uh, about being coached by a man versus being coached by a woman. And um, I, I'm really lucky, actually, that I've been coached by a lot of women. And I think not many women players can say that through their younger careers, especially. Uh, but I've had women coaches uh, in, at club as youth in college and then even at the professional level. So I've been lucky to kind of um, have it throughout my, most of my career. But I just, my only point is that it is so much harder for a woman to coach in the women's game because anytime that a woman goes knocking at the higher administration, there's so much more pushback and I've witnessed it with my own eyes. Um, there's just a different attitude toward a woman coach who's demanding more from the top. And there's even a different attitude from a, uh, a woman coach who's demanding more from her players. I, I've seen the same players have both and give much more pushback to uh, the woman coach and just have worse attitude, um, just worse effort. Uh, it's just a lot. It's it's a lot more work for a woman's coach. Um, yeah, I think that sometimes just in general, because of the way that society works, uh, the presence of having a male coach is just enough to sort of set a certain respect and standard. And I've heard a man, men's coach say, I just know that I am getting more respect from players. I'm not saying it's better, but I just I'll make that caveat uh, because I've had my favorite coach has been a woman. Um, but I just do think that historically speaking, it's been a men man dominated role and there's still some archaic respect to that, um, which is unfortunate. And I think it will continue to change. And certainly with more high level women's coaches in the game, it's going to become better and better and better, but we need to provide more opportunities to women's coaches. There needs to be more women only uh, course certification so that it's more comfortable and you're not one woman surrounded by 30 men and things like that. Um, the other thing I will say is that there is, and this is a little bit of nuance, but there's a, this new style of men's coach that I think wants to be sort of in with the times and then it's almost too much. Uh, it's almost, yeah, it's hard for me to explain and maybe someone else knows what I'm talking about. I can, but, <laughs> you know, like too woke or too, yeah. And, it, and then it almost feels ingenuine, um, inauthentic. And you, you don't take it seriously. Yeah, it's almost, it's almost, um, what's the word I'm looking for? 
where you're just acting or performative. Thank you. It almost feels performative. Um, talking about like the struggle of the women's game and how, you know, he might keep pushing for things in the women's game. It's like, listen, buddy, we've been doing this for a long time. Welcome to the party. Uh, so in that sense, I just, yeah, maybe so, I think I should give the mic up. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll steal this. Uh, if you, I've actually unfortunately not had an amazing female coach in my career, um, but that's, because of a number of things, a number of things, I think one, our support that we've given in the last 20 years to female coaches has been non-existent. Only recently have we really pushed to try and develop females in that space. And I think in the next five to 10 years, we'll probably see that improve a lot more. Um, but unfortunately through the last, my playing career of the 15 years, they, the coaches just hadn't come through. Um, my own personal experience, I don't see any difference. I don't feel any difference. I look at the World Cup now and there's amazing coaches out there. If you look at Jill Ellis, for instance, like has had so much success as a female. You've got Sun Tiger and Begman out there now that are phenomenal coaches. Uh, what Begman's doing with her English team, like after being with the Dutch team and having, having so much success, like they're really paving the way and showing how successful they can be. Um, but unfortunately in, in Australia, we just haven't had that yet, but I think it's coming. Like we've only just put processes in place and, I think also keeping past players in the game um, from my personal experience with coaches, my best coaches have been players, not saying that you need to have played at a high level, but I think having playing experience, you just get it. You just know how the game works. You know, the ins and outs, you've felt it, you've experienced it. You give that different level to what someone could give only experiencing it from the outside. Um, I think that is probably something that gets overlooked at times and you don't really understand until you're a player and, and go through those different processes. Um, but yeah, when we uh, sat down to think, because we've gone through a number of coaches with the Matildas, um, player input is very important. And I respect that our federation listened to us. Um, so we've sat down and, you know, when uh, Hesterina, for instance, that was an unsuccessful female coach that we had, not because of gender, it was purely cultural. Um, she just didn't really click with what we were doing here in Australia and that got found out pretty quickly and then we sat down as a group and said okay what do you want like, was it the fact she was female and we all said no like right female for the right job 100% like we're in um, so gender was never really a factor for us I just want to say one thing that Emma Hayes said in a I don't know if it was an interview or in a documentary but she said whenever she gets a new men's coach on her staff she just says shut up for the first two weeks don't say anything, just observe, learn. And, and the last thing I'll say on this topic as I've talked a lot is that I think it's really important for a men's coach to come in and do just that and observe, especially once coming over from the men's game. Uh, it's just to kind of get the trust from the players first. But yeah, I thought that was interesting. Do you think that at some point a woman could coach a men's game? Yeah, yeah I, I mean, it's happening now, but it, so I- Yes, definitely. I I certainly think a, a woman's coach could coach at the top. A, a female coach could coach at the top level. The game, the rules, the tactics. Yeah, the speed of play is the the only change, and and I think even that is going to continue to improve as women become more full time. But there's absolutely no limiting factor, and I think as we see that trend moving forward, uh, the only thing that I get a little bit worried about is that then great women's coaches leave the women's game. But other than that, there's nothing holding, holding them back. Yeah, that's on men. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think it's the women doing it first. They, they've got to pave the way and that's a challenge. Anyone doing something for the first time, it's going to, they're going to have to go through the weeds so that 15, 20 years down the road, another woman can go through and think this has been so easy. Um, but whether or not men's coaches accept her. My men's players. Oh, men's players. Men's players. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, if you know what you're talking about, you can command a room and, and command respect, I think. Yeah, yes. You know, you know that she talks about absolutely so what's so interesting is that men players accepted women reporters. It's actually the outside male world that doesn't. The players at the top of the top levels accept women reporters because they know that that's their job, they're very good at it. And uh, great, we accept them. 
It's the rest of society that they have. So Becky Hammond, I'm going to argue, who'll be accepted by an NBA player, I'm not sure still whether she would be accepted by the NBA's existence. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think if you have a team that accepts you and reacts to you and respects you and you're getting the most out of your team and the team is getting results, then suddenly the rest will come around. Rel related to what Professor Markowitz was saying too um, about you uh, and Byron and you brought a Byron meeting, uh, several clubs have succeeded primarily with uh, you know, by investing in women that weren't sort of at the Byron meeting level. So clubs like Wolfsburg uh, and Olympic Lyonnais have become better known for the women's team than the men's team. You now have models like Angel FC that exist independent of a, of a male organization. So in terms of that, uh, for, for all of you as, as players, in the organizational structure, is it important or significant and uh, that clubs operate you know, by and for women, uh, or and conversely, if large clubs like Bayern and Real Madrid and, and Barcelona, et cetera, as we know, invest heavily into women's football, do we run the risk of gigantism that exists in the male game with a handful of teams uh, at the top with the most money and revenue controlling the game? What is the best way forward uh, from your perspective? Um, we, when I was at Marshall, we, we had kind of this similar issue of, I think it came actually down to the Instagram of whether we wanted to create our own handle for the women's team or whether we leave it under the, uh, brand of FC Marshall just to create our own vis visibility, um, as a women's team, because you see the posts up for the women's team tend to get lost in, in the sauce of the rest of it. Um, I would say that my personal opinion, I'd love to see independent, um, structures like Angel City FC, just to give them a chance to go ahead make it just for women, see how it does. We know that we've seen success where you have it associated with the men's team and the money's coming down that way. Um, but I'd really love to see people taking, I guess you could call it a risk and just trying that out to see how it goes because you won't know until you try. You could keep doing it the same way and maybe having success, but you don't know that you could maybe have even more astronomical success on the other side when you're giving um, the women all the resources, all the power, all the focus, all the visibility um, in that organization. Yeah. We're trying to calm the mic off. Um... I think yeah, it could go either way. If you get America's different because it's obviously so much money in that country, um, it's easy to build a standalone club. I think if you look at somewhere, for instance, Sabina Potsdam was a standalone club. Uh, while I was there, we did very well. We had some world class players who were always competing for titles, and now they're falling off the radar. Can't even make the top division. And you look at that; they just can't compete in Wolfsburg and Frankfurt and Munich anymore. Um, and that's disappointing just because there's so much money from these big clubs. It's just impossible. Like the Germans can't do it with a standalone club. I think the same would be in Sweden. The same would be here in Australia. I think Cambria United will start to struggle um, as the game grows. So, yeah, it's interesting to see. I think if you can do it alone, amazing, but it's going to be hard to compete with these big clubs. That's great. And we're, we're almost out of time. And since you're not an academic panel, uh, I'll get a quick answer to this question. So you've seen virtually every team play three matches, at least two. Who wins the World Cup? Do I have to first? Before the World Cup, I had to take the was off the table, obviously. I'm batting for them. Um, before the World Cup, I said Germany. I don't know, my gut still tells me that, but I think Japan and Germany, fine. Oh, if I can't pick the tilde. Why can't you pick the tilde? <laughs> Such an obvious <laughs> answer. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I'll be honest, I actually haven't seen any of the US games, which is who I would have said leading into that because of the blind patriotism you have as an American. Uh, but 
I really like Japan. Um, I've seen I've seen little of Japan uh, in this particular World Cup, but I did see them earlier in the year when they were playing against Denmark in a, a training match. So um, I will go Japan. I was gonna say I'm also for Japan and I, I wish that I could say the United States, but I I too have not seen them play throughout this tournament just yet. Um but yeah, Japan is my team. I'm gonna go with my blind patriotism here, folks. <laughs> um, I know the US over the years has been a powerhouse and even the performance that we we've given so far is not the strongest. However, I do think they really do show up in the big moments. Uh it's a young team, uh, but they do have some incredible leaders on that team that I think can kind of raise that level and demand more from the younger players. So selfishly, I want to go to that final. And if they go to that final, I could get a ticket. So I, I'm going to the U.S. <laughs> uh, before the World Cup, I said Ireland. So I was obviously very wrong. Um, <laughs> they were the first ones out. Uh, I'm going to switch it up and I'm going to say Nigeria. Just, uh, just that's, a, okay. that's a bold prediction. <laughs> I mean, why not? Of course, uh, personally, I think the winner of the Matilda's England semi final has a really good shot. So, anyway, uh, please join me in thanking this phenomenal panel of players. <laughs> we'll have a few minutes break and then we'll start back at uh, two o'clock for the next session. Yeah. <laughs> You guys are